Spousal lifetime access trusts, also known as SLATs, are popular planning techniques in today's uncertain tax environment. However, they're not for the faint of heart. They're not super complicated, but effectively designing and drafting a SLAT comes with pitfalls that you should know about. I'm Griffin Bridgers, and this is 10 Minutes with Griffin. For today's episode, episode 244, we're going to dive into some drafting and design points for slats that any practitioner should know about, but which may fly under the radar or may not be organized well in a lot of the literature that's out there. Now, this episode will probably run over 10 minutes, just to warn you, but I want to make sure I'm thorough in my discussion and cover all the material that I've deemed important in this slideshow. I also want to remind you that this presentation is not intended to substitute for legal or tax advice. It is provided for educational purposes only. If you need a slat, see an attorney. Don't draft it based on this presentation. So what is a slat? Well, a slat is, for all intents and purposes, a credit shelter trust that's set up during life. The only difference is that a credit shelter trust uses the remaining estate tax exclusion of the grantor at death, whereas a slat uses remaining gift tax exclusion of the grantor during life. So in terms of design, typically the primary beneficiary is always going to be the spouse of the grantor. And you can have secondary beneficiaries, such as children and descendants, but you don't necessarily have to. You can either give them a current interest in the slat, or just give them a contingent or vested remainder interest in the slat. So the general overview of the goals is that you want to use some of the grantor's lifetime gift tax exclusion, as I mentioned, because Congress is threatening to take that away. It could be reduced by one half as of 2022, if not sooner. You also want to look at freezing trust values for estate tax purposes and also maybe creating a mechanism whereby there's not a permanent gift that can never be accessed by the grantor. Instead, the marital relationship may create indirect access by the grantor to the trust without necessarily treating the grantor as a deemed owner of the trust for estate or gift tax purposes. We'll dive into some of those finer points in a minute, but for the time being, we're going to operate off the assumption that we're just looking at one slat in isolation here, that we're not dealing with the reciprocal trust doctrine, which would arise if each spouse creates a slat for the other. Now that, in and of itself, would warrant its own standalone episode, so we won't get into the weeds on that issue today, but we will have a brief overview a little bit later as bonus material after we look at some of the basic tax principles. Now we're going to look at three basic tax principles, the first of which is that you have to have a completed gift. An effective slat has to be a completed gift because without a completed gift there is no use of the grantor's lifetime gift tax exclusion. So to get there, the grantor should relinquish dominion and control over the trust assets. That typically means that the trust is irrevocable and that the grantor is not going to retain any power of appointment, whether testamentary or lifetime, special or general, over the trust itself. Now, that power of appointment requirement shoehorns into some finer points in the trust, which are usually assumed for any gifting transaction, but are really important to highlight here. One is that the grantor can't be the trustee and can't become the trustee in the future. You also have to make sure that the grantor can't have the power to remove the trustee and name themselves or a related or subordinate party as trustee, because if they can, the IRS can attribute all the trustee's powers to the grantor and thus treat the grantor as having a power of appointment, which would keep the trust from being a completed gift. Now, I want to mention that the related or subordinate party rule isn't black and white. Related and subordinate parties can usually include a spouse and descendants and siblings, but this presumption that they might be beholden to the grantor and take their instructions from the grantor can be overcome to avoid this tax issue if, for example, the beneficiary in question is a trustee. So that would allow a spouse and maybe descendants to be current or successor trustees without running afoul of that rule because they're adverse parties. They're going to look out for their own self-interest in the trust uh, as opposed to being beholden to the grantor. Now, 
If there is no completed gift, there is no use of the grantor's lifetime gift tax exclusion. So this is perhaps the biggest box to check out of the gate. And it kind of naturally progresses into the second tax principle. You want to make sure there is no estate inclusion for the grantor. Now, what this means is that in addition to the completed gift requirements, we want to make sure that the slat doesn't allow the grantor to be a direct beneficiary or become a direct beneficiary in the future. Now, they could indirectly benefit at, due to the niceness of their spouse, who's the beneficiary by virtue of the marital relationship. But the slat should be drafted so that the fiduciary, the trustee, has no discretion to ever give slat assets to the grantor directly without the receipt of equal value in return. That's how you kind of get around that issue and, and tiptoe around the indirect spousal access issue. You also want to, as I mentioned, avoid the grantor having a power of appointment over the trust from inception, but you also want to make sure that the grantor can't later acquire a power of appointment over the trust during life either. And you want to make sure that the grantor can't later acquire the power to alter, amend, or revoke the trust other than any rights that might be given under state law. For example, uh, a modification or termination of a trust by consent of the grantor. That would be okay, but a bare power in the trust instrument itself to alter, amend, or revoke, whether now or in the future, would cause an issue. Now, it may be easy to look at this issue and believe that the worst case here is a state inclusion which would just cause post-gift appreciation to be pulled back into the grantor's gross estate. And there are anti-clawback regulations which would allow a grantor to use lifetime gift tax exclusion and not be penalized if that exclusion amount goes down prior to death, as long as the amount used is greater than the amount lost. There is some benefit to leverage there. But by having a state inclusion, there is the risk that the IRS could deem this abusive or also deem the gift to never have been completed, which would in and of itself deny the grantor's use of exclusion, which is a really bad outcome. We don't want that. Now, another issue here we want to avoid is that we don't want a state inclusion for the beneficiary spouse. So, the beneficiary spouse could have a special power of appointment over the trust, but can't have a general power of appointment. So, how do you avoid a general power of appointment? Well, you can have hidden general powers of appointment, which could pop up in the authority given to an interested trustee, such as a spouse. So a spouse could be a trustee, but the spouse's distributions as trustee to themselves have to be limited according to either of these limitations, or both. You could use either or or both of these, but at, at the minimum, you have to have one. You either have to limit by an ascertainable standard, such as health, education, maintenance, or support, or general welfare, or you have to limit by a dollar amount that doesn't exceed the greater of $5,000 or 5% of the slat per year. Now, as I mentioned, you can have either of those standards in isolation or put them in together. But either way, if a spouse can exceed those standards, they could be deemed as having a general power of appointment, which is bad for reasons I'll mention in a second. You also want to make sure that the spouse cannot, through a power of appointment, discharge any legal support obligation with respect to children and descendants. And you also want to make sure that no Q-tip election is made, although that the Q-tip election avoids the biggest issue here, and we'll talk about this at the end, uh, the biggest issue being the potential for wasting of exclusion. With this transfer, you either want to use the grantor's exclusion or the spouse's exclusion, but you don't want to use both for the same transfer. And if the slat assets are included in the beneficiary spouse's estate, you waste exclusion because the exclusion of both spouses would be applied to the same transfer. And while that's somewhat mitigated for now by a step up in basis, it's still a bad outcome if the total assets of both spouses exceed the exclusions that they have available. There's also some non-tax issues to consider. One is the grantor's access. We don't want direct access by the grantor, nor do we want any sort of guaranteed right of reversion, but it may be possible that 
adverse parties like the beneficiaries could have the ability in a non-fiduciary way to send assets back to the grantor in the future, which would waste some exclusion, but if, if the asset protection and access issues outweigh the tax issues, you may want to keep in mind that the power to send assets back to the grantor could cause the trust to be void against current and future creditors of the grantor for asset protection purposes. So, if subsequent access is desired, you may want to consider naming a trustee in a state that recognizes self-settled asset protection trusts, such as Nevada or Tennessee or Wyoming. And either way, you'd want that trustee change to be either followed from the outset or enacted with a change in situs prior to any sort of access given to the grantor to the SLAT assets themselves. You also want to note that statutes of frauds are a concern and that could allow a creditor to claw back a transfer to the trust if it's made within the zone of danger, either with knowledge of a potential claim coming down the pike or any transfer made within two to five years of a claim, depending on the state and the type of claim. In that, those types of cases, a creditor with the right proof could claw back a transfer to the slat to satisfy a debt of the grantor. Another issue is to consider what happens if the spouses divorce. Now, this is an uncomfortable conversation, and it's one that many people allow to fly under the radar. But divorce should be addressed in the slat, even if it's painful to discuss. Because if the trust is silent, then in a lot of states, the beneficiary spouse's interest and trusteeship under the trust could be terminated once a decree of divorce or annulment is issued. And that happens because a divorce treats a spouse as being predeceased for purposes of estate planning, transfers or trusts or other governing instruments oftentimes, such as beneficiary designations. So you want to address what happens upon divorce. If you want the spouse to continue as a beneficiary, you need to express that. And if you don't want them to continue as beneficiary, you need to express that as well. Otherwise, state law could determine that issue. You also need to consider what happens during the pendency of divorce. Could a spouse have access then? Could they still be a trustee prior to the issuance of a decree? Or do you want trusteeship to switch at that point? That's a huge hole I see in a lot of slats. Another thing to keep in mind is that separation uh, or termination of marriage cuts off the grantor's indirect benefit through the grantor's spouse because there's no longer a marital relationship to rely on to get indirect access. So if the grantor is concerned about access, you need to consider the adverse party possibilities we talked about on the previous slide. And finally, you need to note that the trust itself could go against one or both spouses in a divorce settlement. Now, you could lay out in the trust how you want it to be treated, but the court may not be bound by that. But you may want to address, for one, would the trust be an economic circumstance for alimony purposes? If the trust is silent on that issue, that could be the case. You may also want to consider whether the trust would be treated as marital property or separate property. By default, a lot of states are starting to recognize that this is the equivalent of a transfer by the grantor to the spouse by gift, which would make this convert itself into separate property of the beneficiary spouse, which could increase the amount that the grantor has to pay in a divorce property settlement. Now, there's a couple bonus issues I want to mention, actually three to be in particular. One is reciprocal trust, as I mentioned. And it may be too late to avoid this issue entirely if you want to plan before year end in a situation where each spouse will set up a slat for the other. But usually to avoid the reciprocal trust doctrine, the lowest hanging fruit is that you have to, one, fund each slat at a separate time, preferably in different years. And two, you want to create enough differences in each slat that the IRS doesn't consider each spouse to be in the same economic situation as they were before and after the creation of each slat. Now, there's no safe harbor here. It's more facts and circumstances. But in the worst case, if the reciprocal trust doctrine applies, the IRS could uncross each slat for gift or estate tax purposes. So that could mean inclusion in the gross estate of the grantor or spouse at death. Could also mean 
an incomplete gift, which would deny use of the grantor's estate tax and gift tax exclusion. Another thing to keep in mind is that grantor trust reform has been proposed. And for all intents and purposes, it looks like any transfers now, prior to enactment of a new law, would be grandfathered in and wouldn't be affected. But any transactions between a grantor trust and the grantor after the effective date of the law could be subject to income tax, and any assets added to a slat may not be grandfathered under the new rule, which could cause a state tax inclusion regardless of whether you've checked all the boxes on the prior slides. So it's important to note that you can't just simply terminate grantor trust status by, for example, releasing a swap power under a slat. What rears its ugly head here is Code Section 677. And this code section, by its operation, makes a slat a grantor trust by virtue of the fact that the grantor's spouse could receive income or principal of the trust in the discretion of the trustee. Now, income makes sense, but why principal? Because Code Section 677 also speaks to a couple scenarios. One is that income can be accumulated and distributed to the spouse as principal in a later year. Another is that capital gains, which are usually taxed to the grantor under the grantor trust rules, could also be assigned to principal and distributed as well. So that's why any discretionary distribution to a spouse causes it to be a grantor trust. So to get around this, the grantor spouse has to relinquish the beneficial interest in trust, which is bad. It cuts off their access to the trust and cuts off the grantor's indirect access to the trust as well. So an option you might have to get around Code Section 677 that you have to bake in from the beginning, it's extremely difficult to add this after the fact, is that you could allow adverse parties in a non-fiduciary capacity, such as beneficiaries, maybe to have the power to appoint principal but not income to the grantor's spouse. That should help you get around that because the way the statute is worded is that it says if income can be distributed in the discretion of adverse parties, it still makes it a grantor trust, but it doesn't speak to principal. So as long as you have beneficiaries who aren't fiduciaries who can appoint principal, you may be able to get around this and have a non-grantor slat, also known as a slant. Another thing to think of too is if the grantor wants access in the future, maybe if the beneficiary spouse is deceased, you can do so through a lifetime Q-tip trust, a qualified terminable interest property trust. And you may be able to build in this option and create a Q-tippable slat. Now to do so, You'd have to have all or a portion of the trust where the beneficiary spouse would have to be the sole income and principal beneficiary for life and would have to receive all trust income at least annually. Now, at least with respect to that portion, which is kind of a life estate equivalent, you could defer a determination of the tax treatment until the gift tax return is filed next year. In that case, you could either make a Q-tip election, which would use the beneficiary spouse's exclusion in the future if there's a gift or a state inclusion, or it would have a non-elected portion which would use the grantor's exclusion. So it helps avoid that wasting issue we saw with multiple exclusions applying to the same transfer earlier while allowing you to defer some of the estate and gift tax treatment of this until a gift tax return is filed, maybe even on extension. Now, for the Q-tip slat and the slant, what you could also consider in the wake of grantor trust reform is making each a grantor trust only with respect to income and not principal. So for example, with the slant, you could just say that the spouse has the power to receive all income but never has the power to receive principal. Instead, the principal could go to children and descendants, which might limit some of the exposure under some of the grantor trust reforms that are being talked about, especially for any funding to a slat that would might take place in the future after that reform is enacted, if indeed it is enacted. As always, if you have questions or topic suggestions, you can email those to me at griffin.bridgers at gmail.com, but please note I cannot give tax or legal advice in response to your questions. So if you want a slat, visit your attorney. I'm happy to be your drafting attorney if you're a Colorado resident, but 
Outside of that, I want to mention too that this is not attorney advertising, and I put these talks out to really advertise myself as a speaker and not an attorney, and that's by design. But thank you again for listening to this episode of Much More Than 10 Minutes with Griffin, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.